welcome to Inside the Nation. I'm your host, Eric Thoreau, and welcome to week four for the 2019 season of the Reno Football League season. Um, on this week's episode, I basically continue going on with um, having f- some of the free agent players out there as a guest. Um, this week's guest is free agent quarterback Dennis Alvrilla. Um, I mean, he's most recently of the Cleveland Gladiators, which was his last season back in 2016. Um, prior to that, he spent time with the Las Vegas Outlaws in 2015 and with the San Jose Sabercats in 2014. Um, you'll probably be aware of that with the, the outfit, that shirt that he decides to sport on our interview, in our conversation. So with that said, um, I'm just going to basically get right into it, get right into the interview and in a conversation that we had. And then after the interview, I'll go ahead and um, finish up the show and we'll discuss a little bit about some ideas of the free agency and how things have gone so far. Uh, with some of the free agency selections, and also I'll say um, our next week's guest that I already have booked up for it. So um, if you have any questions, by the way, um, feel free to comment them in the bottom, in the description of this video channel on YouTube or on Facebook, or if you're listening to this on a VR our podcast, make sure you leave it on the bottom of our podcast host um, on Spreaker. All right, so let's go ahead and let's just get into it. Uh, no, no wasting time here, and let's get into our to my conversation yesterday. Uh, yesterday that I had with free agent quarterback Dennis Halvrilla. Okay, I want to welcome um, free agent quarterback Dennis Halvrilla to the show. Hey, Eric, thanks for having me today. So, how is everything going for you? I know you're just like around maybe like 45 minutes north of me. So, how is everything going there? Yeah, everything's going really well down here, and sunny california finally getting the uh the sun come out it's been uh raining non-stop down here but it's been really well really well yeah so we just want to touch base with you with um ninth man mansion i like to um have conversations and you know it's free agent time perfect timing to have a conversation with a gentleman like yourself because you are now saying that you reached out and saying that you're interested in getting back in the league i wanted to reach out to a few free agents last week i had on Tyron Lewis, who we'll get to in a moment because I know you played with him for a year uh, right. with Cleveland and all that stuff. And basically, I just want to reach out and say, what do you look to get for as far as having teams uh, reach out to you and your ability to become a, a, a loan, I guess, a, a starting quarterback in this league? What do you think it could be happening for free agents out there? Yeah, you know, this time of year, um, it's an interesting time. I know everybody brings in at least one vet to their roster. And right now, as it's looking, you know, the vets are getting sealed up and then they're bringing in a couple of rookies to camp. Now, early on the year with injuries, and God, God forbid, we don't want anything like that to happen to anybody. But with injuries and um, sometimes just guys don't pan out the way coaches were thinking, you know, coaches have contact with me. And if, if a guy doesn't work out, they've been, they're planning on bringing me in. So, um, interested in, you know, in having conversations with each one of them just to let them know where I'm at. And, you know, personally, I know I'm in the best shape of my playing career right now. So um, definitely eager and, and ready to get back on the field with uh, any opportunity that comes along. Okay, that's great. So now that we touched base, you know, people are showing interest and you do have an interest. Let's, let's transition actually a little bit backwards. How did the AFL come to your attention? How did you first learn about the Arena Football League and its existence? Um, you know, when I was young, growing up in the Bay Area, uh, it used to be on you know, NBC. And uh, so I got to watch Mark Grieve when I was really young. Mark Grieve, James Rowe, you know, all the greats of the San Jose Sabercats, you know, when they used to win championships nonstop and always have those great battles with the Rattlers and Seth Bonner. And um, so, you know, I got to watch when I was, shoot, I want to say eight, nine years old, I started watching. I was like, what is this? This is, you know, different than regular outdoor football. And it was intriguing because, you know, for me growing up, I've always been a dual threat quarterback, right? So to have a fast paced game, something as a quarterback that we're just scoring consistently, I was like, whoa, I, I like this right here. This is this is awesome. And then you get to watch a great like Mark Greed, um, just time in and time out, just continue to do really well. So it's like, man, I want to I want to watch this guy. And I love watching, you know, people that come before us and people that have built this league to what it is today, you know. And, um, so. I got to learn about it early on when I was a kid and it was something obviously, you know, young kids don't grow up saying, Oh, I want to play in the arena football league. We're always striving to get to the NFL. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't truly know um, what the options were back then. It was just like, Oh, the NFL, that's, that's the thing. Right. Um, as we got older in college and, and uh, when I graduated from college, I actually, my very last game of, 
of my college career, I broke my femur, snapped it in half in a game. And so uh, the doctors told me going into surgery, I'll never play football again, never even be able to run the same again. And so it was an interesting time. And um, I had a couple interests, you know, like Kansas City Chiefs showed interest when I was in college and had some workouts coming up with my pro day, and had some people going to come. But then once the broken leg happened, it kind of dismissed all that. So I had to go through rehab and and then the Arena Football League popped up and it was like, hey, there's an opportunity to play professional football. And so then, you know, it triggered like, oh, Sabercats right there at home for me. So it was, it was pretty cool. Um, it was a journey. Yeah. Uh, it definitely wasn't easy to get into the Arena Football League. It's just as hard to get into the Arena League as it is, you know, any professional league. So I um, had to go and pay my dues. There was a couple years of just training and training and training. And the Sabercats were bringing me in on, on private workouts. Um didn't get a chance to sign anywhere for about three years out of college. So uh, it was it was an interesting grind. And I played in the littler leagues, like the I call them the ABC leagues, all those littler arena leagues. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, every name out there for those leagues. Um, but I played a little bit in there and did well. And so then I finally got sparked some interest through film and um, through an injury. Uh, Russ Mickna went down in 2014. They brought Nate Stanley up to be the starter. And uh, they called me. They said, hey, can you be here by Tuesday? I just happened to be in town. And my wife was pregnant with our first uh, child. And so uh, I drove up. They said, look, you got one opportunity. It's now or never. You show us tomorrow what you got. And uh, if we like you, you can stay around a while. If not, you know, we'll find somebody else. So it's a cutthroat business, just like anything else out there. And I came in and uh, after that first practice, you know, Omar Smith brought me in the office and he said, hey, man, I don't. I know you're with uh, Spokane Shock for uh, camp. I don't I don't understand why they released you. What, what was that all about? You know, we love what you bring to the table. So it was a cool conversation then and, and signed the rest of the year in 2014. Got to uh, spend a lot of time with the Sabercats and, and a lot of great people there. So it was, it was an amazing time to learn um, from some great people. James Rowe was actually still there teaching me. So I was, yeah. I was very, very grateful to be able to learn from people like that. And I got to... I got to face, you know, Kenny Fontenet every day in practice, Cleveland Thompson, you know, some of the greats that have played this game. So I, I got to get some good work in when I was with, with the Sabercats. But ultimately, how is it to work with the man, the myth, the legend, Darren Arbet? Oh, man, he is a character, to, <laughs> to say the least, right? I mean, he's uh, he's got like five different personalities, so it's all dependent on who shows up that day in practice. But amazing, he, he gets the best out of you. You know, he's... Um, He's hard on you, but he's hard on you for the right reasons. You know, he doesn't let you slack at all. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, if, you, if he tells you to jog off that field, you better jog off that field all the way till you're off that field. Don't take one step, you know, don't walk one step until, you yeah. pa- until you're past that line. So um, amazing. He would always keep, a, you know, a straight face and, and make sure that we're on our P's and Q's each and every day. I mean, it really felt like I was in the NFL, you know, uh, team and organization when I was there with Darren Arbet. He, he ran a tight ship for sure. Yeah, definitely. I experienced that the last two years. Um, he's now the head coach down at Cabrillo College in Aptos, and I've been working with him as far as for helping him re- reestablish a branding for the football program and doing live streams of the home games there. So we've been doing home games, live streams this last year, and now we're going to go on to this year. And I'm just helping him out with uh, with his recruiting process as far as for reaching out to families who are not this area. And I see how he does with the players. He has a good relationship with them, but he is down and making. He does have a care for them because he's also now he's doing the athletic stuff. He's he's doing the academic stuff too as far as for being uh, hired as a, a, a coach at a Cambria College. But yeah, he does. He's right on point with his players. So it's uh, you know, and, and being with the fan club president for the Sabercats for the years I was there, I got to meet him there too, and he's just a great guy. You know, and it's really for his players, and he wants the best out of you guys. So, Absolutely. with that said, how was um how I had to go to that well as we were talking before the show, the recording of the show. Uh, how was your very first ever AFL touchdown against those snakes from the desert rattlers? <laughs> oh, it was great, man! It was great. I um, you know, I think the uh, if I recall correctly, the the rattlers were undefeated that year, so. We came in, I think we had one loss, right? And yeah. so we came, they're coming into our house in San Jose. Um, and so it was, you know, we're preparing like every week, each and every week. But uh, that week, say, uh, the Rattlers week was always, you know, a little bit, a little bit more to it. So that week of, of preparation was uh, everybody's 
every everybody was nice and tight, ready to go. So we get in there and we just smack them in the mouth the first half. And we're up probably like 40 points to the undefeated Rattlers. That, and it's late in the year, too. So um, after halftime, we, you know, continue that that slaughter. And, um, and so they take Nick Nick out. And I think in the fourth quarter, they're like, hey, Dennis, this is your opportunity. You ready? I was like, absolutely, you know. <laughs> so uh, I remember walking onto the field for the first drive. And they're like, hey, Omar Smith tells me, he's like, don't be nervous. Only thing I don't want you to do is fumble the ball, right? So yeah. I'm like, okay, because we're backed up on the two-yard line. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. So I come in. He's just like, all right, we're going to run all hitches. And so easy, get my first completion, you know, as, and as an arena football quarterback. He's like, you've been asking for an opportunity. This is it. So um, come in. I remember I had Jason Willis in motion, you know, high motion. So he's coming in in the slot, and uh, we sent him in high motion, I get understand I'm reading the Jack Backer. Jack Backer slides over. And so um, I remember a rusher came into my back. That's so why I sidestep him. And then I see I before pre-snap, I've seen Reggie Gray was the, the backside. And he uh, he was being pressed. So I'm like, okay, I got press over here just in case I can't get this easy completion over here. So Jack slides over. So I slide over and see Reggie Gray puts a good move on the defender. The defender falls down. I just lay it up. And, I mean, first completion, first touchdown pass to an all-time great Reggie Gray. Yeah. You know, big, big play Reggie Gray himself, you know, for 48 yards. I mean, what more can you ask for at that moment with, you know, my pregnant wife in the stands and my whole family is right in front of my home home crowd. You know, I grew up 45 minutes away from San Jose. So it was an amazing feeling to be able to do that in front of the home crowd. Yeah, and what a way to do it, to do it like on a what they would consider a bomb throw, you know, in the arena league for being like 48-plus yards, you know. And, right, and then and then the crowd just even anybody would have just thrown, but the fact that they when the Nick Lino announced it and he announced that it was your first you know touchdown ever in the Arena Football League, crowd just went <laughs> loud. And I remember that you know, and and it was a great thing to say. Oh, okay, we maybe got something here with this you know in in our transition from being so overwhelmed with um you know Mark Reed being our quarterback for many many years and he even tried to come back after the restart in 2011. So. You know, the fact is now, are we going to finally say that have we found our quarterback? Not to put anything on Nate Stanley and what he was tra- transitioning into becoming, and also the, um, Russ McNeil, who I also had on the show in 2016. You know, both great quarterbacks in their time, but, you know, you know, we needed to find possibly the future Mark Reeb of the quarterback, you know. So it was a great thing. So with, with that said, you know, um, I know we went to the playoffs in that year, and we lost that year in the playoffs. And then going mm-hmm. to the 2015 season, you were released to the Las Vegas Outlaws. How was it working for another great quarterback in Aaron Garcia as your coach? Yeah, um, you know, I, I thought in 2015 I was going to come back to the Sabercats. I, I truly did. Uh, we had some great talks in the offseason before free, free agency hit. Um, I took a trip with the coaching staff to Hawaii, actually. We were working out some guys. They asked me to come out there and throw with them. Um, it was an amazing time. So I was like, okay, this is looking good. They had me come out to a couple of workouts out in San Jose. And I was like, cool. Like, I would love to be back here. You know, San Cats fans are amazing. I'm right here at home. What more can I ask for? And like you said, I mean, looking to the future, uh, it was somewhere where I wanted to, you know, call home for a long time. Yeah. And so – um, after they signed Eric Meyer, which Eric's, Eric Meyer is actually the one who taught me before anybody, because I was in camp with him um, when I knew nothing about playing quarterback in the Arena Football League. And yeah. he, I owe a lot to him because he taught me about the reads. He taught me how to get rid of the ball, where to, you know, where, where to start my eyes and things like that. So I owe a lot to uh, him and Andy Olsen for bringing me in that year to, uh, to camp because I, I learned – a tremendous amount with uh jared brown was the quarterback at the time the backup and he had hurt his shoulder so i got it was just me and eric meyer the whole camp and i learned tremendously from him. he's a, an amazing person eric meyer just taught me everything he pulled me to the side and just teach me everything about arena football so i i learned a lot from him um uh, from greeb and then when i was down in vegas um aaron garcia an amazing individual he does he does great things he's more relaxed so when he's coaching He's not uptight, anything like that. He's more relaxed. He's like, look, it's backyard football. Let's do this, you know, and he's a Poco guy. So, you know, he's – everything's ran off the Poco. It's decisions. And you've got to have the right receivers and, and good linemen to be able to run a Poco offense. 
you know, guys that know how to read it just like you. And uh, so he brought in, you know, the vets that played with him, actually. And it was good to have those vets because they knew how to run the Poco. Um, I got to experience playing with Jason Willis down in, uh, in San, uh, San Jose. And so we worked a lot together, and it was great being down there with him. I had, you know, uh, J.J. Radrink as the starter down there, so I was the backup for most of the year uh, before he ended up getting injured. And then I took over as a starter late in the year, came in, won some games. Um, I think I won all my games that year except for when I played against the Rattlers. Huh. And uh, we were in the snake pit, uh, obviously one of the hardest places to play in the Arena Football League, and it was amazing. I mean, we were in front of 18,000 fans that year, I mean that game, and um, we started off, it was back and forth. We were 14 to 14 at one point. And, uh, AG, if he's seen something, um, he would always pull me to the back and like get in my face and just like tear me a new one. Right. <laughs> and he's like, if he seen me not focused and he would always try to make sure to refocus me. And, um, he just, he knew the game so well. So to be able to learn from him, he was, he was a guy that, that did it very well. Right. I mean, he holds a lot of records. And so for him to, to learn from a guy like that was uh, an amazing experience. I, I can't say enough about him. Like I said, he was more relaxed about it. So he wasn't trying to, at practice, he wasn't trying to like yell at us all the time. He was just like, hey, you know what you got to do? Here's the reads, here's the play, and let's make it happen. You know, so it was uh, it was more relaxed feeling with him. Yeah, so how was um, the overall vibe there playing in the desert you know i know las vegas had two stints before the outlaws came there with the las vegas sting before they moved and became the anaheim piranha and then you had the um, las vegas gladiators that came for a few years and then they relocated relocated to cleveland but um how, how was that outlaws um feel there in the community in las vegas walking back the afl for the third time especially with vince neal being the owner yeah vince was at almost all of our practices he would show up almost every morning. The one, the one thing I guess, uh, if I had a change, I wish we were at an indoor facility for practice because we were in the desert. So yeah. <laughs> uh, we would start practice early before the heat, but you know we were still out the, outdoors in the desert. Uh, nice, nice facilities, but you know being in the desert, I just I wish that we were indoors more often. <laughs> but uh, Vince was awesome. He, you know, he came to. He was involved in a lot of things. He was at every game in the front row. We knew he was going to be there cheering us on. He loved football. Um, you know, the community was great. We'd always have new celebrities at our game all the time. I mean, uh, Roy Jones Jr. had a gym down there. He would invite us over there. I mean, we'd meet celebrities all the time. The dance crew, Jabberwockies, loved us. They would come. And we would go to their show. They would come to our games and. Um, they were really cool. Um, I mean, there was there was celebrities at the game every every uh, week. You know, every time yeah. we had a home game. I know that financially uh, got tough towards the end and things like that. But at the end of the day, the team was loved down there. And uh, you know, with the right the right group of ownership, it would still thrive down there. I don't think that it wouldn't thrive. So do you think with now that they have their own actual true sports arena with T-Mobile Arena, and now they have the hockey team there, the, was it the Golden Knights? Do you mm -hmm. think if they would continue going and they maybe transition from uh, Thomas and Mack Center to the T-Mobile Arena, they would more flourish and now that they have a true home facility? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, um, where the arena football is going, uh, football league is going right now with some, some great ownership groups, if there was a – a good ownership group that came in and, and took it on. Um, and I knew about, you know, sports franchises, not just somebody with money yeah. per se, right? Somebody that, that knows how to run a sports franchise. If we, if we got somebody like that in that city, 100% it would thrive. I, I agree. I, I think it would 100%. Okay. So now we're moving on to your, your great career or playoff stint with the Cleveland Gladiators moving um, bringing up the Gladiators early now, now you're transitioning you're going over to another team for your third year in the league mm -hmm. how was it playing for Cleveland and the Cleveland fans there at the queue um Cleveland fans I mean you hear about them all the time right I mean we would pack out arenas literally I I met some really good good friends of mine down there still to this day um you know Colin Taylor I keep in touch with all the time he was an amazing player down there. Work ethic is unmatched. I mean, me and him would push each other each and every day, you know. So um, being down in Cleveland, I got to experience some amazing – first I was with the Sabercats, which is a great organization, great ownership group. 
Then I got to go to an organization like Cleveland, which was an amazing. They treated they treated us uh, second to none. You know, our facilities were amazing. Our practice facilities were amazing. Um, the fans were absolutely amazing. I mean, I felt like maybe not like LeBron, but I felt like I was part of the Cavs organization. You know, like yeah. they treated us very well down there. Um, so uh, playing down there was was an amazing feeling you know um i remember one game me and colin taylor was a timeout or something we just like looked up at the crowd and we're like look look what we're playing in front of you know this this arena is packed almost every single every week so um you know some some of the greats played before me you know in cleveland and um it was just it was just a great atmosphere and and they just the fans down there loved it i remember after getting injured down there i was you know sitting in the stands and i would get Families coming up to me all the time, and after the games, we would sign autographs. And um, just the fan base, they knew arena football, you know, and they knew they knew each and every player individually. You know, they, they weren't just superficial fans. They were just like, this is a cool thing to come to. They actually knew the game. And yeah. It was cool to experience that, you know, just like yourself, right? You, you actually know the game. So to be able to speak to fans like that is, is an amazing feeling for us players. So do you think that uh, coming next year, suppose, well, the summer of this year, they're supposed to be done with the renovations with the queue. Of course, that'll be too late to join because the league will be already in progress with this season. So that's why they're saying 2020 is the return to the Gladiators. And they've kept their website up. Um, they kept their community presence. I've talked to uh, Dominic Jones about it about that and I talked a little bit about that with our last week's guest with Tyron Lewis um, and you played with both um, how do you think the, the fans will welcome will the fans welcome back Cleveland Gladiators to the team uh, to the queue next year absolutely I mean they're probably itching to get it back they love arena football out there so I think they'll it'll be a warm welcome when the Gladiators come back it's uh, it's an amazing community for sure and if someone like you know Don Jones DJ if he's saying that he feels like they're coming back, you should listen to him because that guy was uh, – he's involved more than anybody when it comes to Cleveland sports. Yeah, so uh, how, do you, but how do you think the, um, the Cleveland fans will welcome now that they have an in-state rival just roughly around two, two and a half hours south of them in Columbus? How do you think the, the, the in-state rival will be with um, the Columbus Destroyers? Uh, I think it'll be, it'll be a very good uh, rivalry there. Um, they'll be able to travel to the game, so it'll be, um, you know – It'll be a great in-state rivalry there. Just, it, it's going to be hard to match a rivalry like San Jose, Arizona, but it'll be up there close to it. I mean, that rivalry would be a good one. So, cool. So now I want to touch base with you on um, on some of the free agents. I know your your buddy Colin Tanner has just announced as of the day of this recording that he's back with Albany. Um, what can you say that for the teams that are out there? I think I counted with Albany, their roster is full for the 35 that they're allowed to sign before the cutbacks down to 24. Uh, for the available teams like Columbus, Atlantic City, Baltimore, um, Valor, Philly, if they haven't filled their rosters, what do you think that you could bring to a team and, and to that city as far as for the community? Um, well, for me, I'm a, I'm a very hard worker, so – you know, for me, I get the I get the best out of not only myself but the people around me. I lead by example. You know, when I speak, um, I don't I don't speak often because I know I don't need to tell other professionals how to work. But when I see that they need to work, I will speak up and I'll lead by example. I'll let people see the hard work themselves with their own eyes. So when they're when they're walking into the facility and they're seeing their you know their leader putting in the work. Uh, they're going to want to join, and I get that everywhere that I go. You know, I'm not a guy that's just like, oh, we need to do that. We need to know. I'm going to show you exactly what we need to do. I'm going to show up every day. You're going to see me working, and, and you're eventually going to want to join, you know, because that that's why I've been successful in anywhere I've went is because I do put more. You know, for me, it's preparation uh, equals confidence. Confidence equals success, right? So if you prepare the right way, you're going to be a confident athlete, and any confident athlete is going to be a successful athlete. <laughs> So, you know, for me, that's what that's what I'm able to bring to an organization, to a community. The community will know what they're getting. They'll, they'll see their their leader working hard. As of right now, I mean, with free agency, I see that most teams already have their, if not all, I think all the teams have a veteran quarterback already. So for me to be able to sign before a camp will probably sim, slim to none, and I'm just being realistic there. But early on, first couple of weeks, you never know what could happen and, and yeah. who doesn't pan out. Yeah, and also you don't know what can transpire during the the, um, the progress of the season about injuries and all that stuff. 
like what happened unfortunately last year with uh, Nick Davila going to Washington, and then fortunately I just saw him pitcher in a hospital in Philadelphia. I hope he's all well, and hope he, he comes back and recovers from his injury. Um, Absolutely. You probably saw this on IG. I put out a question. It's something new. I don't know why I didn't think about this earlier in the shows, but to use social media in this way, but I put out saying um, if anybody wanted to ask a question for either for yourself particularly about you or just the AFL, the current AFL, and this guy, uh, Tommy underscore Thayer76, uh, had a question saying, a best fan base in the current AFL. But I want to bring you more involved because um, what do you think, as far as for, from your three years that you've had with, you know, San Jose, Cleveland, and Las Vegas, not necessarily, not necessarily naming the best fan base out of those teams because you're your home teams, that say, and I don't want to single it out, especially since you're wearing a Sabercats shirt right now. But uh, I'm not the same, and you're from the, the Bay Area, but... Right. When you were involved in those teams and you had to go into the opposing arenas, how what would you say that was the best fan base that you went went to? Um, so you know, there was a couple of tough ones to play against, right? Obviously I would say the Snake Pit for one. Arizona yeah. was uh was a great fan base. Um playing against the Sabercats probably would have been another one. Um I know Spokane had an amazing and and it was the way their arena was right so it felt like the fans were on top of you because of how the how the arena was made and and they would pack out the arenas all the time so Spokane had a good one um today's uh to answer Tommy's question there yeah I think uh from watching it myself I think that Albany might have the best fan base right now they are you know unmatched right now in, in what they're able to do in their community and i think albany is a great community and they love the arena football and then you th- you think that's gonna be um taken over by the, the columbus's ninth man coming in and again their destroyers back you think that could be comp- competition even though they have a little bit of a bigger arena there with nationwide than, as compared to time union you think yeah that's possible i know the destroyers have always had a great fan base so um especially with, you know, Dom Jones being a part of the team because he is from that area. So him being there and being able to do a lot of community outreach and and be in that community himself, I think him himself are going to drive in a lot of the fan base and and he'll help it thrive there for sure. Okay. So, yeah, we want to thank um, Tommy underscore Thire 76 from Instagram. Um, for asking that question, hope the answer for me personally, from what I've seen from my experiences in the arena football league, like I said, um, of course I was a Sabre cats fan, but I rooted for my team and all that stuff. But from the passions I've seen, I think the, um, the fans that were, I, that I got involved with were, um, you had the LA, um, the LA kiss fans, you know, I met Brian Fox down there when the, the multiple years I went down there to watch the Sabre cats play and then to go to cover them in 2016. And then, um, of course the snake pit, I went there many, many years, uh, with our historic uh, rivals, um, even got the like I said before the show record. I even got a little bit of an evil eye from Sed Bonner in 2016 when I started doing media stuff. And so, uh, but but we're cool. We had good conversations too. Sed was on our show Inside the Nation as well as his partner Ari Wolf. We had them there. Um, Portland had some good fans too for the Thunder. Um, I'm not sure about the the fans with the steel because that whole thing with the league taking over the team from Terry Airman, um was a bad dealing. But the Portland Thunder fans were good. Um, so, and then I think I went to, well, so, um, I went to the Reno bowl in 2008. So I met a couple of fans from like New York and Georgia. So, and the whole Miss Mosh, you know, but mainly my state was on the West coast. So as far as for the East coast, as far as for Albany, Philly, um, I, I would say the way I seen Albany come out and, and force like that in their first year, you know, and well, and, and not to say that they wish they would have kept the firebird branding, but you know, to go out and say, hey, we got in the team, um, a different team here, but yet it's still a team, and we're going to come out and support our team here because basically the Arena Football League is like the only professional sports they have there, and they can say this is not a football town, but this is an arena football town. And right. I think so. I think Albany's ninth man and the Time Genius Center there is probably one of the, the best fans from, from my perspective of watching it. And um, unfortunately, I know Baltimore – not that great, you know. They're not coming out in shows, but I've heard there's like not really that much as far as for marketing, letting know the teams there from the ownership. So that could be a different play, but um, mm-hmm. it does take a little bit of marketing and advertising to let know yeah, you have something there to offer to the fans. But and I think right. Albany is the 
basically it would say the um, the team to look out for and, and to model themselves out there for any future um, prospects of, of uh, expansion into the future. Mm-hmm. So for sure. But with that I'm said, interested. I want to thank uh, thank you, Dennis, for coming on our show. I know you and I have been chit chatting over the social media platforms for a while. You know. And thanks for bringing back the um, heartache of a, a Sabercats logo in front of me. <laughs> you had to no rub it in, way. you know. That's why I, I'm wearing. I had to. I, I'm neutral, you know. I know it. I know it. I know you're a huge fan of the Sabercats, so I had to. I had to support the colors. And who knows, you know, in the next couple of years, with where the league's going, we'll see if we can make a comeback or, you know, get some teams out here to the West Coast. What I'm hearing. You know, there's there's good uh, talks about coming out to the West Coast. Yeah, I, I feel that the, the way it has to go, if they want to get um, a national TV deal, no matter what the network is, and national sponsorships, they have to have a national footprint. You know, at least a, a couple teams here and there on the West Coast and then and, and down south in the Southwest and all that. They have to have some kind of footprint nationwide in order to gain that attraction. And I think that will better um, – make the league better for the the brandy and all that stuff as far as for sponsorships and revenue gross. So yeah. I know but, they have a good a good plan for sure in place and I know they're trying to build right now on the East Coast because it's successful and then expand from there. So they're doing a good job I I believe. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully they'll come out here shortly before I, I get too old to remember this. <laughs> I'm already up there in age, but yeah, I want to thank you. Maybe uh, I could have you on later on this season and maybe we could just sit down and just talk expansion on where we think you know the good markets are i have some ideas i came across something that was kind of interesting last night um i don't know if i should release but i know that the same day that they trademarked the columbus destroyers name with the uspto that i saw the same day they trademarked grand rapids rampage the arena football one so could that be saying something about you know i know that detroit wanted a team there but they with the new arena there and both the red wings and pistons moving in the operation company that's running the le- the arena there, Little Caesars, wanted to wait two years to try things out first before having another tenant. So the two years is coming up, 2020, Detroit, Grand Rapids being the same owner, who knows? And then, you know, Whoa. the return of the Gladiators. Could that be the, the expansion for next year, those three teams? Who knows? Yeah, we don't know. We don't know. I'd, I'd love to get back on later in the season. Hopefully, you know, I'll be uh, signed somewhere and we'll be talking football instead of free agency. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I would like to see now we can do this one on one conversation, you know, last instead of, you know, via Skype here. But, you know, hopefully that I will have to do it via Skype again. So that way you'll be out there playing and I'll have to say, when's this practice available? <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, sure, but sure. thanks, Dennis, for everything. And, we, and from my opinion, from seeing you play personally, I hope a team calls you and, and reaches out somehow in some way to get you on their squad in some factor. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate your kind words. And thank you for having me on the show today. All right, Dennis. Thanks a lot. And um, go out and enjoy the rest of your Thursday. All right. You as well. Have a wonderful day. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. Okay. So I want to welcome the guest from yesterday's conversation, free agent quarterback, Dennis Havrilla. Thanks a lot for being on the show. He, um, he's a great guy. He's a local guy to my area in the, um, the San Jose market in the Bay Area. So once again, thanks for the conversation yesterday. It was a great conversation. Um, and he's looking to be providing his services at quarterback to any of the, the six franchises that need him. He is a great quarterback. I remember seeing him play with the Sabercats and, uh, of course, on the opposing team with the Las Vegas Outlaws. Um, so it's just a, he's just a great guy. Um, he could get the job done for any team. Um, so with that said, um, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about free agent. Free agency week is basically free agency is almost um, capped off. And what I mean by that is that basically each team that's allowed 35 free agent signings, whether they're rookies or whether they're returning uh, to the team or whether they're coming from an, another franchise they played recently last last year, like in this season. But um I wanted to not really go over the, the the stats of free agency, like what teams made moves or anything. I want to go over how free agency works. Right now with the collective bargaining agreement, we're in the second year of a four-year deal. Um, the collective bargaining agreement was signed into place just prior to last year's season in 2018. So it has four years ago, um agreement then. So now we're in the second year of it. And at the conclusion of each season, um, each te- each player in the league, every single individual player in the league becomes a free agent. Um, as you know, the free agency marks opens up um, 
basically around two months or so prior to the kickoff of the season of the next season. The, the, the way that the league is as far as for being a young team or all the teams being very young and as it being established, except for maybe like the Philadelphia soul um, who've been around since 2004 into 2008 and then had two years off uh, one because the, the seas suspended and then they waited until 2011 to return to the league. Um, basically the way I've seen, I've had conversations in prior podcasts before we did this video show with guests and I agree with them in order to do a reach um, and to get better community relations into the neighborhoods and the communities where each team is serving. Um, you have to have some kind of name recognition with your players and, and to, and unfortunately maybe this one year deal thing with the players is good, but it also could be bad at the same point um, from a player standpoint. It means that you're moving into a city from my, you say like you have your hometown on a, let's say somewhere in Florida. Cause I know a lot of the football players come from Florida and then you get picked up to, let's say like the new team in Columbus. Okay. So you have to make the transition to move your belongings that you would need for your stay in Columbus for the entire year. Um, so I know that's only about like three months, maybe four months at most. Um, of the year and then the other eight months, then you have to go back down to Florida after you're, you're done with that season. Um, that is very, um, costly on the, I don't know as far as the, the, the financial issues with it, as far as for the team paying for the move of the player to move up to their location and then to move back. I don't know if that's part of the collective bargain agreement. Unfortunately, this collective bargain agreement, for whatever reason, has not been publicly released as in prior years agreements have. Um, so I don't know if that's part of the, of the financial dealings with the players to pay for the move to come play for your team and then to oddly to pay for them to move back because um, that's the only reason why they moved up there in the first place is to come play for your team. Um, but and that's just uh, that's difficult on the player. That's a lot of and extra stress. Um, one, one, uh, exception to the rule that I've witnessed is that it was like, it was a uh, quarterback for the Albany empire, the Tommy Grady. He's, um, basically made the decision to relocate him and his family up to the Albany region, the capital region up there in New York, upstate New York. Um, uh, so he made that himself to be mogul. So he sees himself as being more, um, as a regular, quarterback for the Albany Empire until when he decides to possibly retire or, or to go into coaching or what have you for his future uh, career endeavors. Um, but for the most part, a lot of these teams are, are switching players. You see like Varmasoni going from Albany last year. Now he's in Columbus. So a lot of transitions just because he's a free agent. Now let's take the step back. If now if free agency wasn't a yearly issue, Let's talk about if free agency was happening maybe after a player was signed to a contract, say like um maybe like a four year deal or maybe a five year deal. That could benefit both for the stability of the player as long as they know they have stability with that team. And I'm going to just use Columbus just because I started. This is examples for other teams in the in the the league. Um, so let's say you have a player comes from Florida, moves up to Florida, and gets signed to a five year deal. What's good to know that he's going to have stability up there. He's going to be laying. Um, but instead of need to work out the contract to where the player can afford to move up there for the entire five years. And then during the off season, instead of having to move back to the, where he came from before being signed um, to his hometown, he's able to maybe afford to move his family up there so they can make it more of a, uh, a semi temporary to permanent residency up there. Uh, to Columbus, and then during the off season, players can stay in the. They'll be staying in the community, and they can be a visible um, entity for the the organization in which they play for, and that that they would be playing for for um, another four more years uh, according to the contract um, in that community. So in Columbus, so with re especially with the teams like Columbus. And which is a little bit more easily to gain recognition because they've had a prior team. But for places like Baltimore, 
and for places like Washington, D.C. and now Atlantic City, those places, there's no real marketing going on there. And with Atlantic City being new, they've never really had a team before. Um, fans from Atlantic City, if they wanted to see Arena Football League action, they would have to drive at roughly around an hour or so to go to Philadelphia as their closest team. Or back in the early days, they would cl- drive to maybe, I don't know, the distances, but to Trenton, or no, to, to Newark, and they would have to, or, yeah, to Newark, where the New Jersey Red Dogs and Gladiators of past years play there um, at the old arena at um, or East Rutherford. That's where they would play, East Rutherford, New Jersey. They would play there. Um, so the point is, it's good to have a player with stability. Um, they don't have to create such a worry, especially when it gets towards the end of the season. They may be worrying whether they're going to stay there in that hometown or whether they've been playing or whether they're going to have to worry about now finding, you know, and taking the time out to move back to their their hometown that they just came from prior to the season. Uh, so that could also affect the quality of play of the player, not intentionally, but it could affect the quality of play of the player when they, they're constantly worrying about having to move locations. Um Having a, like a five-year contract, just as for example, um, adds to more stability because the player can know, say, he gets signed to the Columbus Destroyers for a five-year deal, guaranteed, and and then he gets um, he does his he does his first season up there. He could you know now move up to an apartment or whatever have you um, into the team hotel and maybe even move his family up there, and he has more stability. He could get you know like I know some, a lot of these players get off-season jobs because you know the arena league is not up there in pay to for cost of living wise. I know it's like roughly around forty five thousand dollars a year. In some cities that's not good enough to have good cost of living. In some cities that's plenty, you know, because the different cost of livings around the country. Here where I'm at in San Jose, forty five thousand dollars a year can't cut it. It doesn't even come close to cutting it. Nowadays here you need probably around a hundred thousand dollars a year to um, have a, a a decent cost of living here in San Jose. Um but with that said um, they could find, you know, off-season jobs up in the like the Columbus area. Well, I'm using that for example, um, and they'll be staying put in that area. And then when they have their days off from their off-season jobs, they could um, do community relations and go to community gatherings and community events or whether for the team and be a representative of the team and be a face of the team. Um, of course, they'll still be, you know, paid for their time and all that stuff from the team, but. At least you're building computer um, brand recognition in your community and and outreach, and you're doing off-season stuff. With this Arena Football League, no matter what version of it you're talking about, when the league was done, maybe about 30 days after the, the Arena Bowl or whatever have you, and players started reporting back home or whatever, um, they shut their doors. There's no activity um, in this league. Um and that's not a good thing, um, if, especially nowadays. Now that they're trying to do expansion, they're trying to work um, to build a new brand or whatever. Basically, they are building a new brand with that launch of the new logo. Um, they're not. There's no tradition now. They're trying to rename the James Foster Trophy, which they never had. Unfortunately, the trophy they've been using since 2016 is not the James Foster Trophy. It's a smaller duplicate version of it. It looks like it, it's smaller, but the original James Foster Trophy and the only James Foster Trophy was unfortunately kept. Um, as far as I know, as far as whether, um, the San Jose Sabercat organization still has that. Um, don't know where it's at, and uh, so don't just because I'm in San Jose, I don't know anything about that. Um, but that's the last I heard that they did keep it, and and they had to build a, a smaller duplicate for the next season, 2016 season, and that's what they've been using, um, including last year for when Washington Valor won the league championship. Um, but anyways, side point is. Free agency, a year-to-year free agency kind of thing, the way that the collective bargaining agreement is structured is not good to help build um, expansion. Um, I don't see how for all these new teams, since the majority of the teams going forward are going to be basically expansion teams, uh, to have players constantly coming and going with your team from season to season. Um, Fans can't get into a certain particular player and build any kind of relationship with that and to feel camaraderie with their team and that could sort of hurt the re, the, the building process and the marketing process um maybe when this when this um version of the cba gets close to renegotiating again to extend it longer the union will 
put in there to have the teams allow them to sign to multiple year deals. That's where I see to get add more stability for these players. Um, I've talked to, um, I can't remember, but I think even like Ivan Soto, I had him on, on uh, inside the nation podcast in, back in 2016. And he's even mentioned about that as part of a way to create longevity of team. He wants to have the players to have stability uh, with a, a particular franchise and, and, Doing multiple year contracts is the way of the future, and it should be the way it is, so that way the players can have their roots um, into the the communities that they play for. It's just like you well, I live in San Jose, I go to work in San Jose or nearby cities, what have you, and then I come home. Um, I don't have to worry about going to another city. So, like if I live in here in San Jose, I don't have to go say to Portland and stay up there for a couple months, and then have to worry about coming back to San Jose. And the fact that I'll have to keep two places a living, I have to keep my rent paid here in San Jose while I go live up there, you know, and renter's insurance, security, or whatever have you, and the upkeep of this place while I go live somewhere else. See, so that that's all I'm talking about as far as for free agency. That's what I want to see the league get back to. I want to see the league get back to multiple year contracts as far as for the the allowance of that for each team. Um, and I know we have a. a Three years left on the CBA. We're, we're starting the third year or the third year left uh, after one year being done. Hopefully, when it comes time when we're down in, onto the fourth year of the CBA agreement that's currently in place, that talks talk before the fourth year expire and don't wait till the fourth year is done, and then that they renegotiate parts and going a year, uh, free agency every year. Maybe they go to three year contracts or four year contracts. Five years will probably be more optimal. Um, it lands more stability from the player standpoint that they're going to be there for five years and they know they could um, set foot in that ground and then they can decide whether they, they stay there and live there in that community or whatever. But that's it. Um, that's all I got for this show. This, this week's of show of Inside the Nation. Um, coming up next week, um, I'm going to have another free agent. Um, but this time I'm going on to the defensive side. I know I had... First, um, free agent wide receiver with Iron Lewis. Um, today's episode was free agent quarterback Dennis Havrilla. Um, next week, it's going to be a free agent defensive back, and that's going to be Christian Wise. So, yeah, Christian Wise, he's well known throughout the league. He's had he's played in multiple cities. So, I'm not going to go into that. We'll go into that discussion next week, and that's who's going to be my guest. Um, if you have any questions for Christian or myself uh, for next week's episode. I follow us on IG. I'm going to use that little question ask feature like I did starting in today's episode. We had one question from a fan and and we had Dennis and I both answered to the best of our, our ability. We answered it. And um, basically, yeah, that's how we're going to do. So follow me on IG at ninth man nation um, and be a lookout a couple days prior to, recording um, sit down conversation with Christian next week I will have that question ready and or any questions um, hopefully we could do no more than I would say no more than 10 questions max the top 10 questions or whatever have you and then Christian and I as deemed appropriate whether it be per Christian's you know experience if you want to ask Christian directly something about his experience in the league and the teams he's played for fine um, or if you want to ask me or do you want to do both of us as a general AFL question Fine. We'll take them. Um, the top 10 questions, I'll select them and have them ready for uh, my conversation next week when I record it next Thursday, and then we'll go live again on Friday for the podcast. Okay? So that's it. I want to, once again, thank you for watching um, Episode 4 of Inside the Nation Podcast for the 2019 AFL season, and I'll see you next week.